Welcome to week three of Travels with Tulsans, sponsored by the Friends of the Tulsa City County Libraries. My name is Marion Sexton, and we are so glad to have you join us for the third of our eight adventures. If you would like more information about becoming a friend of the Tulsa City County Libraries, please visit tulsalibrary.org slash friends. Be sure to join us next Wednesday for Ireland, from the North to the South, presented by Sloan Davis. The link you used this week is good again for each of the next five weeks. So if you don't have a link or lost yours, email friends at tulsalibrary.org to request one. Please feel free to share the link with all of your friends. Our travels presentations are being recorded. If you miss any or would like to see them again, they will soon be posted on the Tulsa Library YouTube page. Feel free to put any questions you may have of our presenters in the chat at the bottom of our screen, of, the, of your screen, sorry. <laughs> Following their presentation, any questions you have will be addressed. Our travelers today, taking us to a, on a trek to Nepal and India, are Becky and Mark Collins. Becky is, by education, a CPA, but she has had a very diverse career. Most recently, Becky was president and CEO of Tulsa Global Alliance from March 2007 until retirement in July 2015. Tulsa Global Alliance is a nonprofit dedicated to increasing global understanding and linking people and institutions worldwide. Tulsa's sister cities is one of their programs. Becky and Mark have lived and worked in Hong Kong, Hungary, and New Zealand and have traveled extensively. Becky says, so far to seven continents, 46 countries, and 46 US states. Becky currently serves as Vice President for World Neighbors, is Board Secretary for the Girl Scouts of Eastern Oklahoma, is Board Secretary for the Tulsa Master Gardener Foundation, and has leadership roles in her church. Dr. Mark Collins, was born in Oklahoma City of Texas parents living in exile. I love that statement. He earned his MA and BA, other way around, BA and MA from the University of Houston and his PhD from the University of Oklahoma. Mark was a professor in finance and international business at TU for 38 years until his retirement. He was a Fulbright scholarship in 2008 in Hungary and had the good fortune to be invited to work and live for short stays of six to eight months each in Hong Kong, New Zealand, Germany, and Hungary during his academic career. Please join me in welcoming Becky and Mark Collins. Thanks. Hi, hi, Marianne. Thanks very much for having us today. I'm gonna to share the screen now, is that okay? Oh, oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna get started right away. We, um, I, I went one, one too far, double click this thing. Let me see what I can do. Sorry about that. I just wanted to show you the, the Nepal flag and Marion, thanks for introducing us. We're, we're kind of excited to be here. Yes, indeed. Well, we haven't had a chance to travel since February of 2020, and so this is just a way to revisit it. Um, this is the flag of Nepal. It's the only flag in the world that isn't square or rectangular, and I think it's my new favorite flag. Nepal is uh, actually called the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal. It's located in South Asia, and actually that always seemed like a misnomer to me because Nepal is actually uh, north of India. So South Asia, I think of, of something else, but it's sometimes called Southeast Asia when you get to Cambodia, like uh, uh, Bobby was talking about. India is on the south of Nepal. Uh, of course, it's a huge country, and India is, and China, the, especially the Tibetan part of China is on the north, another huge country. Just basic information, the capital is Kathmandu. The population is 30.4 million people. Half of them are 24 years old or younger. 
The area is about 60,000 square miles. And just to give you a frame of reference, it's slightly larger than the state of New York. So it's, it's just tucked in there between two of the largest countries in the world, and it's a pretty small one. It is rural and not densely populated. And in just a minute, I'll show you a map that'll explain why that's the case. Yeah, there's one of two maps. I really like this map. It's a road map. And uh, as you can see, there are not very many roads presented here in Nepal. And it's not just because they only show the super highways. There literally are not very many roads in Nepal. Uh, I put in here where Mount Everest is. It's pretty much on the border. And uh, you can see that there really aren't any roads that are observable uh, to get to Mount Everest on either side, the Nepal side or the China side. Um, if you look here, this is Kathmandu. And I don't know if you can see it, but if you can find it, to the right is Bektapur and Pano Panaoti. And one, we will show you four uh, villages that we travel to. One of them was to uh, the east of Kathmandu here. Um, the other three villages, we travel down this road. If you can see there, there's Bharatpur there. And we went south of there into the Chitwan National Park. But the three villages that we visited were more over in this area. And we were, all the villages were in kind of a mountainous area. Here's a, an elevation map of Nepal. Uh, it has kind of four steps, the blue, the yellow, the brown, and the green, and then the white. Um, I, it has meters on the left, but I put in feet for you too. Uh, the tallest is a little over 29,000 feet, so that's pretty much in the Mount Everest and some of the other white areas. And the lowest is 167 feet. The, uh, we traveled, we were in Kathmandu, which is kind of in the middle. It's around 4,300, 4,400 feet above sea level. Um, so when we traveled uh, east, we kind of stayed in the upper levels for the villages. And when we traveled this way, we kind of stayed in the upper levels. But the Chitwan National Park is down in the blue, and we were at about 300 feet above sea level. To give you a frame of reference, Tulsa is about 700 feet above sea level. So Nepal is a very mountainous region. And now you can see why the roads were in the southern part of the country. As far as society goes, the politics, it's a multi-party democratic republic. Uh, the, pr uh, the primary religion is Hindu. It's about 81% of the population. Buddhism is about 9%. Muslim, Muslim is about 4.4%. And then 5.6% is the other. And in that is also included Christians. Reli religious freedom was granted in 1951 but Hindu remained the official religion until 2008, and it still has many legal protections. I'm just trying to correct something on my screen. I hope it works. Thank you. Let me just mention that their economy is a, a less developed level. Uh, per capita income is roughly $3,800, and that's that's measured on uh, uh, per capita, uh, but not so much as the official exchange rate as, as what package of goods does a person need to live. So we call that a measure of purchasing power parity, but roughly 3,800. So that's like uh, uh, $10 a day, and that would be the average. It's among the least developed countries in the world. Their currency is called the Nepal rupee, and the exchange rate, the official exchange rate this week is roughly 118 rupees to a dollar. I mentioned too that it's a very diverse economy. I probably should have a slide for this, but the biggest socio-economic racial group is about 16% of the entire population. And there are nine groups that are above 4% of the population. Employment by sector, you can see here for Nepal, these numbers re reflect a very undeveloped economy. 69% of the workers are in agriculture, 
12% of the workers are in industry and 19% in services. In developed countries, and I just use Canada as a benchmark here because it's not as big as the US or Germany or some others, but this would be typical of any developed country. It was very small percentage in agriculture. For Canada, it's 2%, 28% for industry and 70% for services. That's how economic development moves from agriculture to services. Nepal exports palm oil, clothing and apparel, carpet, soybean oil, flavored water, and people. It's interesting that, that between three and a half million and five and a half million Nepal men, usually men, work abroad. That big variance is due to changes in COVID-19 uh, numbers. The salary repatriation, in other words, money that these people are sending home, accounts for almost a fourth of their national income, 20 to 25%. Here's just a great picture, I think, of Mount Everest on a clear day from the CIA fact book, one of the reference books that I found useful over, over my career. Our presentation of Nepal considers poverty in developing countries. And we're talking about uh, an organization that's independent nonprofit called World Neighbors, uh, that believes in a hand up rather than a handout. And we're doing that just to put in context our trek because we went as representatives as part of a delegation of world neighbors. And you heard Marion too say earlier that uh, Becky is uh, the board vice president for uh, world neighbors. Our emphasis, the emphasis world neighbors has is on education and capacity building. They hand out very little money. They send in an expert to teach people things. That's their, that's their model. Primary tenants are world neighbors. When they go in to help a village, they go in with an exit strategy. They begin asking the communities, what do you need? They don't, as I said, they don't provide in-kind goods or services or money. They help the beneficiaries help themselves by building local capacity. And they go in prepared to stay for, for a long time, but not forever. So maybe 10 years, but they always as I said, begin with an exit strategy. How do we finish up and, and, and leave? So our trek was February 18 through 15 of 2020 in Nepal, and then uh, 16 February through 20 in India. The World Neighbors started working in Nepal in 1973, and as they progressed, vi villages graduate from the program and new ones start. World Neighbors started working in India in, in 2002. And the first villages they started working with there have already graduated. Okay, I'll start you off with us arriving in Nepal. Um, of course, we flew into Kathmandu. And so we'll talk a little bit about Kathmandu and then we'll take you out to the villages and then we'll take you through our, our quick trip through India. But these are just some images that I took. We were in, uh, of course, flying in on the plane and we were going from west to east and we were flying along the Himalayas. So I took several pictures out of the plane window and added, had other people <laughs> sitting next to me take pictures. And this is just one where you can kind of see the snow blowing off the peaks. And of course, uh, uh, they're taller than the clouds in this picture. As we were about to land, you can barely see the engine right here in the lower corner of this picture. Uh, there were many of these kind of buildings spread out for quite a far distance but you can see that they were built very close to the runway. We're, we're not too far from landing. And uh, it just gives you an idea of the architecture. And this pot of marigolds is in front of the hotel. We were staying at the hotel, of course, called the Shangri-La. Marigolds are very important to uh, people in Nepal and, and so are flowers, which is some a benefit for me. I love seeing all the pretty flowers. Um, Kathmandu, um, the main word Kathmandu is really one of three um, kingdoms that were there. There were three ancient cities. And then of course there's new Kathmandu too. Um, these are actually pretty close to each other. Uh, there, it was kind of surprised if, to hear that there were three kingdoms that, that close together. I have a before picture and an after picture because so many of you are aware that there was an extremely de devastating series of earthquakes in 2015. This is a picture of Bhaktapur, Durbar Square before the earthquake. It was called the um, area of temples. And then you can see what uh, the earthquake did at the beginning. 
just to give you an idea, um, the first earthquake was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. It was northwest of Kathmandu, it was about 48 miles away. There were two aftershocks pretty fast. One was 6.6 .6 and another was 6.7. Of course, everybody ran out into the streets. It was terrifying. Um, many of the houses tumbled to the ground. You can see that many of the temples tumbled to the ground. Um, then on May the 12th, there was an aftershock of 7.3 magnitude, and it was northeast of Kathmandu by about 47 miles. So it, it helped pull down the rest of it. People lived outside for the longest time uh, simply because uh, they were very fearful of more aftershocks. The back to poor Durber Square, and Durber Square actually means palaces. So you have Kathmandu Durber Square, Bhaktapur Durbar Square and Patan Durbar Square. That was a little confusing for me at first. Um, this Durbar Square was, was, they have a date of 1427 uh, AD, but the city actually started in 865 AD. The inhabitants have been very active in rebuilding. They are making significant changes to the town's appearance. Uh, they are replacing buildings with those made of more earthquake resistant materials. Each of these three towns could kind of choose how they wanted to rebuild. The Kathmandu Durbar Square renovation, which I don't have a picture of that, it has been slow. Palace construction there dates back to the third century. The Kathmandu Durbar Square was used as the King's Palace until 1896, and it is used for coronation still. It was used in 1975 and 2001. Back to poor Durbar Square, I have a picture of it still under construction in, in uh, 2020. And then you can see that Patan Durbar Square has pretty much been finished under its reconstruction. So they went at it in a different way. Of course, uh, millions of dollars were uh, given to Nepal to help with this rebuilding. Um, as you can, can guess, these are historical sites or world uh, worldwide known uh, important uh, historical sites. Patton Durbar Square uh, uh, inscriptions were found that date back to 560 AD and uh, the area there, and that the third one, which is the one on the right, the area there is popular for woodworking and metal crafts. As we, we already said, Hinduism and Buddhism is very important in this country. On the left uh, in, in uh, Patton Square, there was the river goddess Genga. She's standing on a tortoise uh, and it's in front of a temple on Mul Chalk and it's in Patton Durbar Square. This is a very ancient statue that's still outside. On the right is an example of uh, uh, Buddhism. These are prayer wheels and they're usually associated with Tibetan Buddhism and there's mantras written on them. And so you do chanting, and it helps you uh, more be in tune with, with Buddhism and, and Buddha. Other sites in the Kathmandu area, uh, these are very famous puppets, also called marionettes that we saw in one of the shops. And on the right, this is a mythical guardian statue uh, and it was helping guard one of the temples. Just living in Kathmandu, there's the marigolds again. These long uh, uh, strands of marigolds are used in all kinds of festivals and decorations. You can see some beautiful flowers. We were there in February, but it was not very cold. And you can see that he has a jacket on over here, but um, I was very surprised. I'm showing you this picture on the right. This is a water well, it's just smack in, in, the, in the middle of the city. Uh, many people do not have yet have water piped to where they live. So they do go to the wells and get water and you see the kids kind of playing in it and you see them washing things. And there's the big tubs where they're carrying the water. So Kathmandu was, was a wide range of skyscrapers and then people still carrying water. I have a friend who always asks me, well, what did you eat on your trip? So I remembered to take a picture fortunately of this before, before I sat down to eat it. So this is, this is one of my pictures. Uh, this is a very traditional meal. Uh, this is for, uh, it does have chicken, but it can also, most of these dishes will work for vegetarian in many of the uh, 
Hindus and Buddhists both are vegetarians. Uh, and included in this is a kind of a pickled item, a rice and lentil curry. Over here is something that was identified as black eyed peas. I don't know what kind of greens they were, but it was light greens. Over here is something like chicken curry. And then of course there's many other things, including the flat black bread. But it was very delicious, very nutritious. Um, the director of World Neighbors who was with us on our trip is a vegetarian and she would get something like this, except like I said, without the chicken. Although I have a friend from India who says he's a vegetarian, but uh, he, can, he still eats chicken and fish. So I guess it depends on what, what your termination of uh, the term, I mean, well, how you uh, define being a vegetarian. I had to take these pictures. I was just, just so startled to see all these wires everywhere. Uh, this was not too far from our hotel. And you can see them all bundled up here. I took this picture just to show you a colorful bus too. But when I asked Srijana, who was the director of World Neighbors, why, why is it like this? She said that it's partially because of the lack of infrastructure. The city or the state doesn't really take on wiring everything and providing electricity for everybody. So for instance, if you lived in this building and you wanted electricity, you'd have to figure out how to get it there. And so people just add their own wire. So I'm sure there's more to it than that, but that's the simple explanation. And uh, I always love it if we accidentally bump into a wedding. And um, one of this was taken in, um, I think it was taken in back to Poor Square. And of course, there's beautiful places there to have your wedding photos made. So this one, uh, bride is in a beautiful red dress. And this was part of a procession that we could see from our uh, outdoor restaurant where we were having lunch. And this bride is chosen to wear white. Now, then we moved from Kathmandu to Chitwan National Park. Part of the reason we went there is, is to be someplace uh, th that was fun to be in a national park, but also we're now in a part of the uh, country where there's not very much housing. So this national park at least had hotels. <clears throat> one morning they took us in this dugout canoe on the Rakti River, which is one of the major rivers in Nepal. And it just happened to be foggy like this. And it was, I just thought it was a breathtaking picture. You can see that the fr front man has a long pole the river was pretty shallow and there's actually crocodiles in the river, although the guy claimed he saw one, but we went by too quick for us to see it. But it was, uh, it was a fun little trip down the river. When we traveled in a minibus to get from Kathmandu to uh, the Chitwan National Park, and you can barely see there's a road over here. The first part of it, uh, it uh, and you can see it on that road map that I showed you earlier, is really in a river valley. This is really a major river for Nepal. And so, of course, as we do here too, you build roads and train tracks along the uh, river valley. Uh, the, it was a major road, one of the most major roads there is in Nepal. Um, it, um, of course, you drive on the left, there really isn't a center line. Everybody just fills up whatever space there is. I would say there was three to four lanes worth of highway. Um, and it was kind of fun. Uh, so the driver was on the right and then uh, there was like the um, navigator seat, if you will, on the left. And so Mark is about six feet tall and one of the women in our group is 5'11". So they were gonna trade off sitting next to the driver. So after just a few minutes, um, the Caroline, who was the person sitting in the navigator's seat at the beginning, uh, said, Mark, I think it's your turn. And she never took a turn back because it's rather terrifying because all the, all the, the vehicles driving in the opposite direction are just coming straight for you, but nobody's going very fast. So for instance, the distance between uh, Kathmandu and our hotel in the Chitwan National Park was only about 106, 110 miles uh, away, but it took us six hours to get there. On the right is just an example of what travel looks like in the little village where uh, we were, our hotel was in the National Park. So you can go by foot or you can go by cart, go by kind of just look like cows to me. I didn't know cows would pull a cart. 
We couldn't find our way at first. Uh, so the man on the left is our bus driver. And so he kept asking for directions. And I do not know what transpired between the woman who lived in the house and our bus driver. But I just, I was able to snap this picture out of the bus window and he, <laughs> he wasn't looking very happy. <clears throat> the two women on the right are mother and daughter. Aren't they beautiful in their saris? And they were able to help us find the hotel. This is a little a tour guide, a nature guide that uh, Mark and I were, I think the only ones that took him up on going on a walkabout in the village. Uh, everybody else was, was kind of, uh, it was a long day, that six hour bus ride. Anyway, he wanted us to see a rhino, but I think he already knew it was going to pretty, be pretty hard to see it, actually. But he did show us a path. <clears throat> the rhino just kind of goes as a, in the straightest line he can. Didn't care about this brick wall. Didn't care about the vegetables being grown. He just, the river was down there, and he would just make a straight path between the river and wherever it was he decided to go. So I then believed that there really were rhinos. Uh, and these are fairly famous. They're called one horned rhinos. Um, the, the population there in the National Park has grown from about 200 to a little over 600. And it's the uh, largest population in one area in the world. These are the, the four villages. These are pictures representative of the four villages that we traveled to. And I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about them. Kwadi. Uh, the one in the upper left uh, has been uh, in the program for four years. Their savings and credit group, which Mark will talk to you about more in a few minutes, uh, has 32 women. And they contribute 200 rupees a month. And so, and the conversion rate for 100 rupees, Mark just told you, I think it's about 118 rupees to make a dollar. So 200 rupees might be $1.60, $1.70. So each family will contribute 200 rupees a month. That's their decision. Each savings and credit group makes up all its own decisions. They've decided to charge 15% interest. And this is a certificate that the, this woman won at an agricultural fair. The Dundee group, which is in the lower left, is the group that has graduated. They have 58 households in their savings and credit group. They went from four households to, from 24 households to 58 households. They started at only 20 rupees per month. Then they went to 50 rupees per month and then 100 rupees per month. Um, the Coda group, which is in the lower right, has 41 households in their savings and credit group. They started at 50 rupees a month and then decided to, to start charging 100 rupees a month. Um, they have only been in the program, I'm not sure how long, but probably only four or five years. They have now have uh, 80,795 rupees in their capital. So they have through interest and through the um, just savings have that much, which equals about $700, between $650 and $700. They've decided to charge 12% interest. The Calgary program, which is in the upper right, has been in the World Neighbors program for five years. Uh, they have really moved up through the steps quickly. They're already on the third stage of five stages. They've moved a little bit faster. Um, this meeting house that we all met in and the seed bank, which you'll see another picture of in a minute, um, uh, they have been able to, to make this happen through their savings and credit group. One of the women donated the land um, and then they all chipped in on 700 rupees each plus with their capital, they were able to build the meeting room and they lock it up and they've started the seed bank. Uh, each woman told their own story. Each, as whenever we go to one of these villages, each woman will stand up and tell their story. They have the right to do that. Uh, one of the women said that the earthquake destroyed all of their houses. They were all had nowhere to live. And that within one week, World Neighbor had figured out how to reach them and they brought enough food and supplies for two weeks for everybody in the village. And they said they are never going to forget that. 
Um, their savings and credit group started at 50 rupees a month, went to 100 rupees a month. Their charge, they've decided to charge 18% interest. And uh, they now have capital of 149,000 rupees, which is a little over $1,200. Uh, one of the women that you'll see a picture of in just a minute told me that they really are excited about having a, the ability to borrow from themselves. She said, we don't have to buy seeds now. We have our own in our community group. I don't have to talk to the money lender. I don't even have to ask my husband for money. She was pretty excited. We'll take a closer look at just four of the programs uh, from these villages. Their uh, World Neighbors has over 30 programs that the villagers could choose from. Mark will talk briefly on sustainable agriculture, water, savings, and credit. And then I'll wrap up with health and hygiene. Um, I just took a picture of this elephant. I just thought it'd be fun to, we did see that in the nature preserve, uh, although they were imported, but I thought it would be fun to show this picture. In these rural areas, the historical agricultural <laughs> picture would be maybe an animal and a, a couple of crops like rice or lentils or some main, some main crop that could sustain people. And the goats often live in the house with the people or uh, by the side of it. Uh, so one thing that uh, I'll mention now is that the goats in the area we saw were mainly grown for meat, just like with cattle, goats, uh, you know, some breeds of goats are for meat and some are for dairy. And while they did have some goats they used for dairy, in this area, most of the dairy they got from water buffalo. One of the things that happened uh, over time with training is uh, learning how to maintain the goats in a little better fashion. Uh, these goat houses, as you can call them, uh, were everywhere that we visited and they were new and the people were quite proud of them. They learned how to keep their goats, actually you can see elevated, uh, the fodder and, and even some blanketing here, uh, rather than just living in where they go to the bathroom. And uh, the manure and the urine were useful uh, byproducts of goat raising that were used in raising the, the plants. Sometimes the goats get to go out and just have some fun. Uh, we actually saw two or three different uh, times for this particular scenario, goat riding along on the top of an SUV. The water buffalo uh, were prevalent used for dairy rather than for meat, but, uh, and occasionally to pull wagons, but they're, they're I mean, they're a very good uh, investment, except they're kind of expensive. Uh, the rupee translation of the price for a water buffalo would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000, but you could recapture that in less than two years from selling the, the milk uh, and the dairy, dairy products. But $1,000 in rupees is a really big amount. I mean, you heard the numbers that Becky was, was mentioning earlier, you know, it took months for the group to save $700, the group. So a thousand is, 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 a, is a big number, but once you had one of these, it was, it was uh, you know, a, a treasure, literally. The agriculture, the crops people grow uh, are important for, for them to be able to, to, to live in the areas where they are. They live in rocky soil on the side of mountains, relatively poor soil. Uh, and they want to learn to grow a variety of crops. Composting is one way. They had composting programs. One of them was their worm composting program. You can see this woman was quite proud of it and wanted to show us all uh, what was happening with that. And I mentioned earlier, they also use the, the goat manure, manure in some of their agriculture. Water's a key. Water's one of the things as you move up into the to the hills and the, the low mountains and the high mountains, uh, you know, the water becomes more and more of a problem down in the lowlands, rivers and lakes. You see us going up uh, one of the, the treks to get to the villages in the four wheel drive vehicles. I think that's the first one and we're back in the second one. We actually had to stop one time and push it. Uh, the incline was so steep, the four wheel vehicle wouldn't, wouldn't go up or maybe wouldn't go up with me in it, I'm not sure. But anyway, we had, we, we had to get out and, and push at least one time. 
the water is way down in the river valleys. You can see over this woman's shoulder and up high, they need to have some sort of traps or small pools that they've built to catch some of the water. So this catchment helps them have water to use on their crops. And here they are actually using an, an irrigation system. I'm by a cistern there. They have metal piping over to the fields and then bamboo piping to kind of drop you know, one, one drop at a time, if you will, is locate, localized on the particular plants. Here we are with one of the groups, and I want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about this idea of the savings and credit groups. Uh, we call that microfinance. But before I do, you take a look at the group. This is the members of the, the, the savings and credit group from one area, but they're not all from the same group. They're in the sense of the same ethnic group or whatever. And in many cases, they'll be wearing this, this traditional garb, which they seem to wear for for us, but probably also when they had meetings of their credit and savings group, uh, you know, they'd be almost the same, but just a little bit different. In a, in a couple of slides, there's a picture of me standing by two women. And one of the reasons we took it is to show the difference in height. But as you look at that picture in a minute, you'll see two women that seem to be dressed almost exactly the same, but not, not quite. And they're from two different groups. But this idea of savings and credit groups is very important for the economic development of the rural people in, in Nepal that we're talking about here. Uh, you know, it's started with the idea, we'll give some money to some women and they can loan it out and get it back. Uh, but savings were, was realized to be much more important. And the savings program that they had allows them to build enough money to make their own loans. Here you can see a couple of the treasurers and we were, were interested in, in these people. Uh, because they, you know, they kind of managed the money, if, if you will. Here's that seed bank that Becky mentioned before. Again, they've actually built this whole building from savings and loan, savings and credit loan money. Built a building, very secure building. They maintain the seeds and of course they keep them locked in, in the building. They don't have to buy the seeds. This is an entrepreneurial venture. This woman and her sons run a road, this is really a roadside uh, stand uh, up in Nepal and uh, near the village where we were visiting. Her husband's not there because he's abroad working and sending money home. This man we were very interested in and in the last village that we visited because he'd been away for five years and he came back with enough money to really start a pretty, pretty, uh, larger agricultural venture at home. And he brought more men into the group. This group had more act men actively working in the group than the other three we saw. This is his house. It's probably the most substantial house we saw in any of the villages. His family on the right, house on the left, and you can also see an outbuilding for animals on the left. Um, just We just threw this in. Uh, this is starting with health and hygiene took a picture of this woman as we were going to the village, but she's not one of the villagers. This is the old way women had to bring in um, uh, and feed for their crop, for their animals. They would walk into the forest um, and they would cut down whatever was growing there and bring it back home and feed their goats. Over on the right is the, um, the um, fodder that they now grow in the villages. This is a World Neighbors Program. This could be NB21 which is a very nutritious uh, brand of fodder that's growing. I mean, I know it doesn't look like much, but just imagine, wouldn't it be great to have this growing in your fields and your, you can just cut it and just walk a few steps to take it to your goats. Um, surprisingly, in many of these villages, uh, people are still subsisting on lentils and rice. And so the World Neighbors Program, if the communities choose it, is to help them start kitchen gardens. So, because of course vegetables are a lot healthier if they're added to your diet. I'm not sure what all of these, these vegetables were. It looks like something that's a little bit like lettuce or basil over here and, and green onions. Um, you can see that um, they are growing cabbages. Uh, they, this woman in the middle uh, was very proud of this vegetable. It took me a few minutes to figure out what it was, but I think this is a white radish. They would also grow their uh, crops and then take them to a market. 
the market was in a very small village, but other people, uh, apparently it was very successful for them. Uh, before we world neighbors went into the village, they, they didn't have any income because they didn't grow these kinds of vegetables. They now grow potatoes, tomatoes, chilies, rice, cabbages, corn, mushrooms, fava beans, marigold garlands, cauliflower. Uh, they have mulberry trees, mango trees, lychee trees, lemon trees. So um, uh, this took a while, but they, they would have to, to perhaps borrow, uh, get somebody to come get them because there weren't any automobiles in the villages where we were. And this was about a two hour drive. This woman was very impressive. Uh, her English wasn't there. She had other people talk, but she was the president of the sustainable agricultural group in this village. You, she let us come and look at her house and her warehouse. You can see how beautifully stored the, um, the very vegetables are, the rice. Um, she had enough money as she probably used the savings and credit group to get this rototiller, although I imagine they all use it. And she's been very successful at rice intensification. I mean, this is a very ancient crop to grow, but different parts of the world have figured out ways to make it a little more successful and World Neighbors has helped them learn how to do that. Uh, healthier living conditions include this stove. I was pretty surprised that she was um, uh, cooking in this stove, um, but now they've put a hole to the outside and the smoke can, can uh, exit the house and it's a better health quality. And then of course, um, this comes from the United Nations. This is not something World Neighbors dreamed up, but going through all these steps really helped um, before the pandemic started that people already had wash stations, people already had toilet houses and they were taught how to wash their hands regularly. I apologize that we've uh, uh, kind of gotten excited about our Nepal trip and didn't take you much into India. But if you can hang in with us or another couple of minutes, we'll show you some pictures from India. These dresses just happen to be called a kurta. I'm wearing one right now. And I think I would like to wear one every day. They're so comfortable. This is our staff, our world neighbor staff. These were dancers in one of the villages. Mark, they were trying to get Mark to dance. He was laughing. This is the World Neighbors president. After the reporting, they were asked her for her response. You can see other small children, probably a happy grandmother. Little chickens up here. They give us uh, gifts as we go into each village, the scarves and the flowers. These are two beautiful little girls. The one on the right had just come back from school. She was wearing her school uniform. They were lucky. They lived close to a village and the, they could walk to school. Beautiful, probably grandmothers. The woman on the right was, was only sad that world neighbors hadn't been around when she was a younger woman. Didn't see too many children. This village, this was the only child we saw. And you can see that everybody's kind of helped raising the baby. Another very distinguished grandmother. We had to visit the, the state, uh, the regional government people, and they wanted us to visit them. They wanted to sign more agreements because the World Neighbors programs were bringing uh, a better uh, economic situation into their region. This is a medical doctor. We were gifting him with a flag of Oklahoma. He was about two hours from, one, our, from away from our programs. Here we are in India. Just a quick visit to the Ranthambore National Park. And um, we went there because uh, one of our board members is really wanted to go see a tiger. We saw a sloth bear. We saw a cheetle, which is obviously a spotted deer. <clears throat> we saw a parakeet. We saw langurs or black-faced monkeys. We saw a striped hyena, just briefly. One people, person in our group was just lucky enough to catch that. You can see how good his, his camouflage is. This is a, called a red seeded bulbul bird. <laughs> Camels are not indigenous to India, but they are there, they're very useful. And so we took some pictures of some just strolling around. This is a street vendor in the, uh, in the Rathambur 
uh, park area. You can see women wear their saris all the time. This is the highest apex animal that I saw. It was a leopard. Uh, good thing I had a long zoom on my camera. We were definitely not this close to the leopard. And he was kind of actually higher up on a hill where he could uh, see all around him. Seemed very well fed, very powerful. Really, we're sorry we didn't see tigers, but there aren't that many there. Just finishing out, I'm a cyclist, so I took a picture of this bicycle repair shop. It was actually much bigger than my picture shows, but really old bikes that they're they're refurbishing. And then Jaipar, the Jaipar Castle and Jaipar is behind us. You can see the Lake Palace behind us there in, uh, in, in that picture. The Amber Fort in Jaipar is pretty well known on the left. You can see the, the I guess, sort of traditional snake charmer on the right, the grains, the multicolored grains, uh, really was even more vivid and, and, and exciting to be there in person to see it, but I think you can catch her with the picture too. The fort, uh, the palace is up at the top in that picture. Uh, there we are from the bottom getting ready to go so you can walk or uh, ride. We chose not to walk. And in the other picture, the center picture, a closer view of what the, the place looks like, what the, the palace looks like. The Amber Fort, you can see here the gardens, the gardens in the lake. And then the woman on the right is actually watering the plants around the fort. So a very interesting place. But uh, the last place we want to just talk about uh, Kutub. It's uh, a complex started in 11, uh, 1193. So, so uh, you know, the, by a Muslim ruler quite, quite a long time ago. It's a picture through the through the wall in the uh, in the in the building. This is the highest minaret made of bricks. Okay, seventy three meters tall, the highest made of bricks. And here you can see what the work is like, uh, the composition is like of the of the the walls down at the bottom. We're sorry we ran over, but we'd be happy to take questions if you have any. That was wonderful, fascinating. <laughs> um, we have just a few questions. If you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the chat. One person, Peggy, wanted to know uh, the reason why they mainly have women in the World Neighbors Program. Well, this is uh, actually uh, not true in other countries. World Neighbors has been going on for 70 years, and uh, we are currently are in 13 countries. And um, it's primarily in Nepal because the men leave and they go work in India or they go work somewhere else and they send the money home. But the men that you did see in the few pictures came home, realized how well their wives were doing. <laughs> growing and selling vegetables and uh, growing and selling goats that men, the men are beginning to stay. And I actually uh, don't know what the pandemic would have done in all these cases because uh, many of the men had to come home. So I'm just, I'm waiting to see uh, if we'll have more men in the programs going forward. But we have quite a few, for instance, in Kenya and places where the men don't leave to raise money somewhere else. So would that be contribute to the reason why there's so few children in the village? I think it would. <laughs> <laughs> if you only come one home once every two or three years, <laughs> fewer children. Uh, Glad wanted to know what, what the man was grow, growing in the bags. He was holding those bags. Um, good question. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. Those are mushrooms. And then that room, which was purple, that's actually a room in his house where he grows mushrooms. So mushrooms was a cash crop for that man. And that's the medium they grow on. Oh, you mean the what's in the bag is the medium? Yes. Oh. I know. So do they actually grow them in the bag? Oh, they, they grow out on the edge of the bag. You can see them sticking out. And I wonder what's sticking out. And that's the mushroom part. Interesting. It's very okay. interesting. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and Dorothy says, what a fascinating presentation. But thank you. Lord asked you very many questions. But I well, somebody had fashion. raised their hand. I don't know who it was. I don't either. Okay. I didn't see it and they didn't put anything oh, in the chat. Lynn or Annette raised her hand. Well, Lynn, what is it you wanted to know? <laughs> <laughs> you need to type it, please. <laughs> I can I can add just a little bit more about the the gender question too. It in these uh, these uh, microfinance situations, it's almost always been the women that control the money and and really ran the the operation. You could say, and in part, they were the ones that were funded. And you know, in the early days when this was when they were funded mostly by gifts, they funded groups of women and they controlled it better. But they've always been more active in it. And uh, I think it's because what's happening with the money is small, but what's happening with the money is closer to the home and the family. But, but it was interesting, uh, you couldn't see in some of the pictures, but all of the women, all of the people who were meeting with us, almost all the women, people were meeting with us were women, but there'd be four or five men peeking through the window or looking through the door or things like that. So it's, uh, and in the last group, it was much closer uh, to 50, 50, probably 35 or 40% men and 60% women. And I think it's because the guy that was in with the mushrooms was so successful that, that it was bringing back a, a little bit more attention from the, from the, from the men. Well, that's great. But I was just thinking, I wonder what it does to the dynamic of their marriage <laughs> when the woman <laughs> becomes more self-sufficient and, Yes, he's been doing well while he's been gone. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder too. Yes. Um. Somebody says that you can grow mushrooms on a toilet paper roll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it doesn't take much. <laughs> Apparently not. I know that there's. I think that there's quite a bit of um, mushroom growing. I think in Miami, here in Oklahoma, in that there is, area. There is. Yes, I was aware of that. Yeah. Lynn said she was just exploring the buttons and she was a little <laughs> embarrassed. Okay. No worries. <laughs> she put it in the q and I I didn't see it until just now. <laughs> there was, I'm trying to think, of, there was something else that I wanted to ask you about, but I don't remember what it was. It was fascinating. I love your travels. I hope you'll do another program for us soon. Oh, well, it's very know, kind Not of this you. year. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, this year is well booked. But uh, yes. we enjoy yes. it, and uh, it's, I really appreciate the library putting this on because, uh, you know, there's that book that was written called The Armchair Traveler, and that's a little bit what this is like. And so it's fun to travel through other people's pictures and stories, isn't it? It is, absolutely. I've always enjoyed travels, but especially during this pandemic time when most of us aren't going anywhere. That's right. And, oh, no, I did, oh, glad I did not see your question. Vlad says, did you see my question about food and drink? Oh, I, oh, she said, did you have any trouble getting clean water and food? Um, we are very careful about that. Very, very careful. And Nepal and India are both countries where you need to be very, very careful. Um, <clears throat> for instance, um, you only drink bottled water and you know where the bottled water came from. Uh, you only drink, eat cooked food. Uh, you can eat bananas and oranges because you can peel them, but you shouldn't eat fruit that just is washed and not cooked. Um, and our um, the woman who was in charge of us was the director of World Neighbors, and she um, is very familiar with what those rules need to be for Americans. Um, and when we uh, first traveled to India, this was our second trip. And when we first traveled, we went to the health department, and they said, "Don't." even let water from the shower get in your mouth or your eyes or your nose. And so we don't do that either. But Mark and I, knock on wood, have neither, neither one of us ever got sick in Nepal or India. So, so you just, you can do it. You just need to be very careful. Yes, I, I had an experience where I apparently wasn't as careful as I should have been. Um, <laughs> Not fun. <laughs> uh, Dorothy says, 
thank you. And I look forward to, join, to you joining Travels for another presentation in the future. And- That's uh, very nice, thank you. Thanks. Sherry said, thank you, Becky and Mark. Great presentation. Thank you. And Laura says, great program, thank you. And not, that's about it, I think. Okay. okay. Thanks Wonderful. A lot. Thank you so much. Well, we'll see and you I next week. Forward. Absolutely good. Ireland, you said, north to south. Yes. That sounds great. Yes. Apparently, Sloan goes to, to Ireland quite frequently and takes students. He's a, he uh, teaches at TCC. And uh, so it'll be interesting. It'll be beautiful and it'll be green. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. And thank bye you bye. to everyone who came. Bye-bye.